Welcome to our Enterprise Blockchain, the Path to Monetization Workshop. Um, my name is Guido Molinari, and I'm the managing partner at Prison Group. In today's workshop, we are going to be discussing with a number of uh, industry leaders that are going to be joining us over the next three hours. Uh, I'm going to be kicking things off with a brief, brief introduction about us, Prison Group, and presenting a couple of frameworks that we can use. Uh, when thinking about some of the insights that um, the better speakers are going to be sharing with us this afternoon. Um, and then uh, I'm going to be leading uh, uh, the first uh, uh, set of fireside chats uh, where we're going to have joining us uh, Mariana Gomez de la Villa from ING Bank, Dimitro Migliorati from Banca Mediolanum, Olaf Ransom from Finality International, and Ricardo Surbiani from Microsoft. Uh, after that, I'm going to be uh, leading, uh, giving the um, the floor to my colleague Rick Cataldo, who is going to be hosting a session with speakers joining us from Ireland and the US East Coast. Uh, we're going to be having with us Jaron McGowan from WeTrade, Shyam Nagarajan from IBM, Chen Zer from Ernst & Young, and Daniel Wilson from TradeLens, um, and uh, uh, Mark Treshock from IBM Pharmaceutical Utility Network. Uh, after that, I'm going to be coming back and uh, with me, there's going to be um, another set of speakers joining us from the US Midwest and the Rockies. Uh, among them, uh, there's going to be Adam Kaplan from Salesforce, Merrick Vance from United Healthcare, the Synaptic Health Alliance, and David Post from IBM, Trust Your Supplier. We're going to then uh, take some uh, key takeaways uh, together with uh, Kathy Barrera, our founding economist at Prison Group, and we're going to draw some conclusions together from today's workshop. Uh, our first panelist here today, um, which is Mariana Gomez de la Villa. Uh, Mariana is the DLT program manager at ING Bank, and she's joining us from Amsterdam. Uh, ING, I'm sure many of you are familiar, is the largest bank in the Netherlands and one of the 10 largest banks in Europe. Under Mariana's leadership, uh, ING has been one of the most active players in the enterprise blockchain space. Uh, they are a member of Trade Finance Network Marco Polo, uh, a member of the Energy Focus Post Trade Management Platform VAC. Uh, they're a member of the Letter of Credit Blockchain Platform Contour, and they are a member of the on chain payment in wholesale, so wholesale banking market, Finality International. Welcome, Mariana. How are you today? Thanks. Thanks for Thank you very time. much for the invitation, Guido. I really appreciate it, uh, and I'm really excited to be here. Wonderful. So, Mariana, you know, you have been involved in directly in many enterprise blockchain initiatives, uh, and I'm sure that there have been, you know, many hurdles along the way. Uh, what's, in your view, one of the main challenges that you have had to face to monetize your blockchain efforts? Well, uh, yeah, you have to be patient uh, because it sometimes takes time, right? Uh, it's not that, uh, for example, we started um, experimenting with the technology years before, and more or less in 2016, we started after having the first proof of concepts that we made. And actually the first pilot that we have in production was in 2017. And we are just seeing, uh, you know, the monetization efforts back in 2019. So now in 2019, we are actually to commercially, being able to commercially live uh, um, uh, and, and, and issue these transactions uh, for our bigger clients, right? So then uh, it took us quite a while to arrive to this stage, but I'm really happy, for example, because monetization can be seen in different ways. I mean, in, in one of the ways that we see it is we uh, got benefits uh, for increasing efficiency of 33% uh, for, for example, the traders, right? And then we're able to do as well some transactions, trade transactions that originally we will do in a specific time, and now we're doing it five times faster. So uh, we see uh, monetization efforts not only obviously as, as, as revenue streams, but we also see it, for example, in uh, cost efficiencies, on operational efficiencies, or as well on capital improvement. Thanks, Maria. That, 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 that's extremely interesting. And um, I imagine also that, you know, given the distributed nature of blockchain innovation, that requires so many stakeholders to come to the table, that this has required a sort of a shift from the current way of doing things, right? Yeah, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because indeed uh, you need a totally different uh, mindset, right? You need to balance a lot of interest at the same time. So while you have to actually, you know, make sure that they 
by your vision and then they are you know also supporting you from from that perspective right and they are sharing that vision with you you also have to listen really carefully to what are their concerns what exactly are you know the things that actually uh, yeah might might hinder you from moving forward and you have to educate uh, them a little bit and listening to those concerns as well and applying those concerns uh, in your processes so make sure that uh, that you bring them along with you, you know, along this journey of learning, you're learning together, actually, because if at a certain point you leave them behind, you know, and you lose them, then you won't have the participation that you need to actually go live. And then you won't have as well uh, the support that you need for them to actually be able to be or do their part in this huge ecosystem. Right. So then you need to be uh, really careful with it. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that, that the challenge of educating at the same time that you need to actually do the development is one that we've heard from many many of our clients as they went through their their blockchain efforts now um you know thinking more about um the opportunity for blockchain monetization so where do you see i um, mean you, know, you guys are involved in many different networks with amazing use cases where do you see the biggest opportunity going forward uh, the same as a lot of different companies, we started by the long hand fruit, right? Things that we saw uh, could improve already in the bank. Uh, and being such a huge company, you always have things that you can do. You can, you can always find opportunities. But uh, what excites me the most is, for example, the fact that we can, or we are sitting in a lot of illiquid assets. And then we can now, with this distributed ledger technology, actually, uh, you, we are able to uh, make those illiquid assets into more liquid assets. And as well, you can have now the cross-border exchange of ownership, and you can have fractional ownership. And that gives way to different type of business model, that gives way to different type of uh, revenue uh, uh, models and to different types of actually uh, having, you know, asset management around it. So it's really interesting, I think, what is yet to come. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we from our standpoint, asset monetization is something like sort of the holy grail often, right? Like, you know, and, and because it could bring so much liquidity to a certain type of asset pricing. Uh, I know you guys, you know, as I already mentioned, are a member of Nalty International, and I know Olaf is going to be talking about um, some of this topic later today with us. Um, so, um, you know, we uh, are, of course, holding consensus distributed online this year, given the outbreak of COVID-19. And, um, you know, I, I imagine that the crisis has, you know, potentially affected some of your initiatives, maybe brought new opportunities around. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how the outbreak has affected your team and ING's, you know, strategy on, on blockchain? Well, uh, yeah, we're a distributed team. Uh, we help the, the organization globally. So that means that we have had projects, you know, that are in different geographies. So from that point of view, you know, the, the, the work hasn't slowed down. But uh, what it is true is that listening to our customers, they need more financial flexibility. And they need as well, for example, to find that liquidity that is lacking, right, in a lot of different markets. Uh, so we try to support them as well uh, by listening, for example, to their business models and trying to figure out whether there are new opportunities and, and where they can adapt them as well to this new way of actually making business, right? Uh, because everybody is changing. Everybody's business is changing. So, you know, we have to adapt and then we need to make sure that we help our clients as well to adapt to these new times. Very interesting. And, um, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, these new business needs that have come out of... Uh, uh, the COVID outbreak, uh, you know, one of that has been highlighted to us by many is the need now for more automation digitization, given it's hard to do things in person at this point because, you know, the outbreak is, is still ongoing. Um, I know ING has been very active in this field. Can you tell a little bit, of, a little bit about the initiative that, that, that your bank has taken in this regard? Yeah, so uh, indeed, digitization is something that we have been doing already for quite a while. Uh, we are not there yet, I think. You know, there's always, again, something to do more in an automated matter or, or some processes to improve. Uh, but we found, uh, for example, that uh, because of this pandemic, then uh, people needed to be, you know, like you don't need to touch anything. You cannot touch anything, right? Otherwise, you run the risk of, uh, of maybe getting uh, contagious. So 
um, what we are experimenting currently with is a, a sort of invisible payment. So you can, for example, grab a train and then the train via geolocation will know actually where did you actually board it and then where did you went down. So for example, from people to a central station and then the, the payment of that specific uh, uh, travel trip, you know, will be done uh, via your mobile. So you don't have to touch absolutely anything and you don't have to tap your card either. So uh, that's, for example, one of the experiments that we're doing with a company called Fin. Okay. And do you see a role for blockchain in this, in this type of experiments where you have, you know, multi-stakeholders involved? Yeah, of course. Uh, I know, for example, there are a lot of consortia working on, you know, identity of things. You need to identify yourself. Obviously, you have Internet of Things. You know, those uh, are really nice complements to actually what you do with blockchain together with data. So, uh, yeah, I think the role of uh, cybersecurity, the fact that, for example, you are less prone to a specific uh, mistake, the fact that everything can be automated, you have the benefits of the smart contracts, etc. So uh, definitely the blockchain uh, needs to play a role and will play a role, I'm sure, in that together, for example, maybe with the provenance of a specific uh, uh, food chains, uh, supply chains, as Nadia mentioned before, from the World Economic Forum, etc. Yeah, and, 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 and that leads me to sort of the next question, you know, what are the industries you see, um, you know, that in, in your view, like the current outbreak will, will give a boost to the blockchain initiative because of an immediate need really for, for a particular aspect that blockchain can bring about? I think that the obvious ones are health, are uh, yeah, supply chains, and I'm crossing my fingers for asset utilization as well and tokenization. So uh, that part of the asset distribution, I think it's quite interesting and I, I hope it gets a boost as well, not only because of uh, central bank digital currencies, but as well because of, uh, of, of, of blockchain being able to enable this specific solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Marianne, I know we are, you know, um, surely running out of time. If you were to give a recommendation to, you know, a blockchain industry leader out there that are maybe, you know, not as advanced as ING is in their initiative and they're sort of taking their first steps, what would be one recommendation that you would give as they, they take their first steps in thinking about how blockchain can uh, affect their business and how can they monetize their efforts? I think uh, what I like the most from in the industry as a, uh, it's, is the fact that it's a, it's a team effort, right? You never arrive anywhere alone. You know, you always do it because, because of the people that is with you in this journey. And I think what I love the most about working in blockchain and these real ledgers is that people is quite open. Uh, they always try to help you. They're always open to discuss, you know, experiences, failures, uh, uh, you know, gains, etc. So you don't need to start from scratch. Uh, if you poke into anyone, anyone will be willing to help you and bring in, you know, whatever their experience has been so far. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I think it will be that, you know, just, just tap into, into any person uh, in this conference, for example, you have a lot of networking opportunities. So tap into them and I'm sure everybody will be, will be, sorry, will be willing to help you out. Wonderful. Well, Mariana, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights and, um, you know, hope you stay safe and hopefully next year we'll be able to meet in person at Consensus 2021 in New York. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Thank you for the invitation. Bye.